Welcome everyone to our 2024 series of OTF Connect webinars. My name is Peter Beans and I'm honored to be your moderator for today's session with Susan Elliott entitled Climate Change Challenges, Educators Exploring the Opportunities. Before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge first and foremost that we are gathered in the province of Ontario on the traditional territories of various indigenous peoples who have been present on this land known as Turtle Island since time immemorial. We acknowledge that this has been a meeting ground for generations. We are grateful to be the stewards and caretakers of this land. As advocates, teachers, and educators, we understand our collective responsibility to honor, protect, and sustain this land. We further recognize and honor within the membership of OTF those who are indigenous to this land. This practice of recognizing the ancestral and traditional lands in which we work, live, and play is a concrete action that we undertake as a first step towards reconciliation between Canadians and the Indigenous peoples of this land. But it is not our only step. Collectively and individually, we must seek to denounce the injustices and wrongs that have been committed against the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and to dedicate ourselves to cultivating and maintaining relationships based on mutual respect and truth. For today's OTF Connects webinar, we have Dr. Susan Elliott, who is an Institute facilitator at the organization learning for a sustainable future. Susan is an educator, program lead, and professional development facilitator in K-12 classrooms for public and independent schools. Her doctoral research in authentic assessment and curriculum has guided her in supporting diverse learners as a special education teacher at several school boards, including the Toronto District School Board, operated school at the Hospital for Sick Children. She was executive director of the Learning Forum at the Toronto French Schools until 2020, leading a support services team and overseeing guidance and wellness, learning strategies and resource, technology and libraries. And with that, I will turn it over to Susan. And here we are. Can people see the screen okay? Yes. Yes. So welcome everyone. And uh, it's exciting to be here. And thank you, Peter, for introducing the session. And I wanted just to extend that bio, bio to talk a little bit about LSF and my involvement with uh, LSF, I have been a teacher, kind of like the green teacher in schools for many, many, many years. And working with the professional development that LSF organized, I became much more involved in environmental education and environmental teaching across subject areas. And so I've had the great good fortune to work with many teachers in many schools, uh, including OISE, their, um, their uh, programs around additional qualifications in environmental education and I'm very happy to be doing more and more of that related to climate learning now. So just as a little warm up, um, Peter, you can help a little bit here. We're just trying to find out who is in the room and what grade levels people are teaching. He tells me that you should write it in with the subject area, but then don't press return because this is something called, I guess, a live chat or a waterfall, you called it. Mm -hmm. So if we could just put a little bit in there as our first idea. I'm just going to have a look and then it'll help me know just maybe what grade levels to focus on a little bit more. So if we've got a few things in there, we can uh, we can draw on that information. And the second question I wanted to ask is what did you notice observe outside today, perhaps as you were coming home on this snowy afternoon? And if you could put in something that not maybe not just you saw, but maybe something that you heard or smelled, or maybe you tasted one of those snowflakes or touched it, what it felt like underneath your feet. So it'd be nice to include that as a, a comment as well. What are we thinking, Peter? If you have your first question queued up with your subject and grade, go ahead and hit enter. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so we've got a variety here. And then go ahead and cool. keep, yeah. Keep the second question. Four French immersion. Yeah. And the second question. Sunny, cold. <laughs> Any other senses? Anything you noticed? The snow was so fluffy. Yes, this is what I'm looking at right now. We've been snow starved, I think. <laughs> this is great. Yes. Squishy. Squishy. I like the squishy. Good description. It's winter every day where I live. Well, 
it's that's that's a wonderful comment to make. We're look at we're uh, we're uh, enjoying the the moment now that we have, but sometimes at the end of February or March, we're not as happy with that. Airy, lovely. Thank you for so much for that. I think it it sets the tone for today um, to be connected to each other and also to be connected to um, the information that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, just to as a little bit of an introduction here. We're going to just speak just briefly about LSF because it may be an, an organization you haven't heard of. So it's a small organization. There's only about six or seven people, plus a number of uh, retired teachers and, and part-time teachers who are working at, across the country to develop some of the education, the knowledge, the skills, the perspectives, the practices essential to a sustainable future. So we have most of our, almost all our material in two languages, which is great and have lots of uh, partnerships with educators and organizations across the, the, um, this, the country with our head offices at York. And I think our primary focus has really been support for uh, curriculum connected to teaching. So in this session today, we're going to explore a number of things. Climate change challenges, education, educators exploring the opportunities. So we're gonna be focusing much more on the science and technology curriculum and learning how to prepare students to meet those challenges. We're really looking at, um, whoops, sorry. The session will include a little bit of the research in the last five or six years, LSF has gone into the research area about um, attitudes to climate change and what teachers need to be doing, strategies and resources. And then we have a number of new materials that we've prepared in the last, I think about three years, three or four years, that really focus on climate learning. And we have now this website, climatelearning.ca. So the science and technology curriculum, it's in the last year or two, it's been uh, uh, unro uh, rolling out and teachers are getting used to more and more aspects of it and what it means, what the changes are and how best to implement it. And so just to think about that, you know, as you begin to develop your practice on the new curriculum, I want you just to be thinking about a STEM lesson or a design challenge experience or inquiry that was a big hit with your kids. And if you feel up to it, pop a, a line or two about it into the chat, but otherwise just keep it in your mind because we're gonna be looking at what does the cur curriculum actually ask us to consider and then what, might be uh, the elements that make what we're doing in STEM so engaging for students. So if you have an idea, something that comes to mind, pop it in the chat. So one of the great things about the STEM area and the curriculum is that it, there's a great focus on active learning. If you look at some of the verbs that they talk about in it, it says engaging, applying, real world issues, um, impacts, looking at impacts, um, supporting students and exploring, um, lots of activity involved. So it's a really a, an area where we want them to be doing hands-on and collaborative work. And I think in climate change, we're thinking, okay, if we're doing all the STEM work, maybe it should always be connected to the areas that we're trying to um, have students think about. So if we kind of look at a list of what create the dangers for our earth, We've got a, a, a list that we can identify pretty clearly there. And if we think about the saver side, we can think about these areas, including things like uh, protecting ecosystems or plant rich diets, or if it's business, circular economy, waste to energy, we've got a whole list of things that can give us good connections for our STEM projects. So thinking back about that example, Peter, do we have one or two examples? that we could have a little uh, engagement with? Yeah, no, none came in the chat. Oh, just one now. My students really enjoyed creating a visual art piece that depicted, depicted learning about how changes in the North are affecting Northern communities. Wow, so art connected to design, that's great. So if you think about it, what made it so engaging? It might've had that active learning, that experiential, that, cre that creative part, uh, certainly if it's an art project, creative, innovative use of knowledge applied to real life. So in the one that we've got there, applied to living in the North. Here's another one. Uh, we did inquiry and research about the wildfires in Ontario. Amazing, 
Again, inquiry, real world, applying use of the knowledge uh, that we're doing in school and yeah. the research skills. And we did a water filtration activity, layering different materials and connected it to a water advisories in Canada. Wow. That, again, the perfect connection, making something in class, definitely covering the curriculum, applying it to a real world problem. So when we do those things, that's where it becomes engaging, engaging and purposeful and meaningful for kids because they can see that what they're learning in school absolutely rela it relates to their life and maybe even their future career. Yeah, one last one uh, in outdoor ed, designing sleds out of cardboard and <laughs> heights were, it was a big hit. Wow. So in thinking, what was the first one that sleds? Mm -hmm. So there's so many possibilities related to uh, design and efficiency, which goes faster, right? You can easily think about how they'd add experimenting to that, the whole area of research and experimenting to the fun of designing it. And certainly probably was collaborative as well. Certain lots of challenges there. Again, something you can use, make and then use. Relevant, purposeful, has meaning. And I think more and more that's what we're starting to see in curriculum design is that they are looking at how can, how can the, the material that we're learning be made more meaningful. So we know that STEM and its connections, engineering, design process, hands-on, but this is kind of interesting how they've really been developing the indigenous con contributions, the knowledges, perspectives. And it's the first time we've really had more information around food literacy and of course, climate change. So when we do these projects and we relate them to real world projects, we also know that we are definitely meeting the curricular requirements. So in general, we're trying to make this connection between learning uh, and climate action, looking at maybe solutions are related to mitigation or adaptation or perhaps both. We're always being aware that kids know and care about the events that they're happening that are happening in their life. They're listening to everything, they're hearing it, they know something about it, and they're coming to us for the the real information that's researched and well validated and also they're um, helping they're looking to us for how we're going to deal with this in the future through their learning. So one way to very clearly link it to meaning and purpose is to find some ways of connecting our learning to the sustainable uh, development goals. And we know that there's a wide range of them, some that are very applicable to STEM. Others are more to do with social studies and social inquiries, but we know that we've got lots of connection, life underwater, life on land, climate action. There's lots that really does, uh, connect easily to STEM. And there's others that can be, the connections can be made through the discussion process. So keeping the sustainable development goals in mind is probably a really good way to uh, add one more layer of meaning and purpose to your classroom. So in just uh, reviewing a little bit about this uh, idea about um, the research arm of LSF, we've done two sets of studies, one in 19, uh, 2019, one in 2022, to look at what Canadians perceive as the importance of climate change and its link to education. Uh, we've done those two sets of national surveys and I, there are many, many slides and we showed a few of them the last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but the two that I wanted to focus on this, uh, this week is around the fact, if you see on the bottom there, that the science of climate change teaching and climate uh, learning, 72% is the focus that um, Canadians feel that education should be addressing. Give us the real information. What do kids need to know? But also, and almost equally important, are the social, economic, and political aspects of it. And that we know that there's more elements to just the science, not just the science. So we wanna make sure we include that. And then this other uh, slide that kind of shows where we are now and um, who is teaching it and where. And of course, what we're hoping to do have is an interdisciplinary approach. We're hoping that more subjects come together in it. But we can see that science is still, uh, you know, really the main area where the climate in information is given followed by social studies, somewhat into geography, sometimes it's a mix. And uh, it really does fall to a number of subjects. So wherever we can make interdisciplinary links, we want to definitely be doing that. 
The other thing that we noticed that there, there was a bit of a drop in what we were teaching right after the pandemic. And so we think that we probably were really focusing on getting kids back in school and getting some of that learning happening on the core areas. And maybe this was an area that lo it lost its focus for a year or so. But what's kind of important here on this slide as well is that many teachers say that it's not covered at all, about 35%. So we also think about how much time we're spending and how many hours, not, not, uh, not as much as we could. So though it's changing, climate change learning still occurs most frequently in some of the STEM subjects, even though we want to make sure those links are made. And there's so many things written there, I, just even chatting to a number of teachers, they're, the boards are producing things, there's lots of material out there that you can buy that give design challenges. I've just picked out a few that some teachers have mentioned to me that they've picked up for their, for their uh, schools. But um, I think the other part of it is that we want to make sure that we are making good advantage of what some of the other organizations, and there's lots of them across the country uh, that are preparing for support for teachers. And I've just put this slide up as a bit of a dashboard of some of the things that LSF could offer to teachers. And we're going to be looking at a couple of them today, diving a little deeper into them. But one of the things I do wanna mention is that we have action project funding. And um, that's a process where that if you've got a project that has developed out of maybe something in the classroom that you wanna make it go a bit bigger, but you're gonna need a little bit of seed money to make that happen. That's uh, an area that uh, kids could pursue in terms of getting some, you know, between one and $500 of funding. And uh, a lot of teachers, a lot of uh, PD workshops I've given, teachers have said, yeah, that. We needed more than that, but that was a little start for it. And there are lots of other materials that we have here to explore, and two or three of those are going to be the focus of today. So these are the three documents that are related to climatelearning.ca, and uh, in each of those, we're going to be dipping into um, a couple of the inquiries that are built within it. And I don't know, Peter, can you just let me know, or is there, was there a subject area do you think were a bit more people, just so I know which, which one maybe to spend a bit more time on? Uh, we've got high school science, French immersion, um, homeroom teacher, so they may be doing science, mm -hmm. free service. Okay, so we've got a range. So I think we're okay. I'm going to be going into each one of these documents and kind of pulling out a few highlights that you might want to explore. And uh, uh, then, you know, if there are questions after that, we can talk about that. So these are the three documents. And all of them really work towards moving our practice from conventional classroom to more tra transformative thinking about the school without walls, the community venue, more active learning, lots of approaches, real world connections, and lots of inquiry. So um, I'm going to be talking about two or three resources, but we're going to start with the climatelearning.ca. And I think, Peter, you gave them the link at the beginning to these slides if they wanted to have them ongoing. Do you want to mention that or where that is? Yeah, I'll drop it in again. OK, so there are three guides that we have uh, designed, K to 2, 3 to 5, and 7 to 12. And um, all of them are based on inquiry as the, as the prime kind of function and structuring process. And each one has the kind of uh, fairly similar uh, organizational uh, method there so that it, it's done so that it could be easily used as a guided inquiry in the classroom. And of course, teachers can decide, well, I'm gonna use the provocation from this and I'm gonna use the knowledge building or you know, they can pick and choose what they want to use but all of them are kind of set up in this way. So um, they, this one has five different uh, themes or chapters and within it, and we'll just look at how does climate change affect our world. We'll have a look into one of those now and, and show you a few things that are in there. So climate uh, chapter two, how does climate change affect our world um, has uh, a number of inquiries. I'm just gonna show the first little video so it just explains the structure. Um, there's one of these videos in the beginning of every uh, of the chapters to explain what the chapter is about, but this gives you an idea. 
Chapter 2, How Does Climate Change Affect Our World? The focus of these inquiries are on systems and how we are all connected to climate change. They are transdisciplinary and have several links to the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as a myriad of curriculum connections. These activities are scaffolded, but can be used in any way that works for your students and curriculum, depending on their background knowledge. There are many examples of strategies that can help students understand the big ideas. Challenging concepts such as systems thinking, thinking of a community as a system, and equity can be approached through a systems thinking lens and can be assessed after completing the different activities in the inquiries. How can we help students understand that we are all connected to systems in our world, in our community, and in our natural world? Using an artifact as a provocation will hook student interest and initiate student thinking. At this point in the inquiry, we want to harness students' curiosity and build off the provocation that has captured their interest by generating meaningful questions to continue to drive the learning process. I think a car is a system because if you take one tire off, it won't work. What if the moon didn't have trees so they all got dropped down and and everyone that was on the moon will they all, all go, got dropped down? They, there was no oxygen anymore and then they couldn't survive. Students may be ready to engage in a group knowledge building activity. It will encourage them to open their minds to many alternative ways of thinking about the provocation and ideas that have been generated thus far. Students can provide insight into which concepts need clarity, what students already are well informed about, and a general direction that they want to pursue. Um, the three things I learned about systems are, are if you take a bit, they won't work. If your system doesn't work, you can fix it. Systems, systems move. Students can begin researching their questions or do some of these activities to enrich their understanding of the concept of a system and the relationship to climate change. So what are you? A washing machine. A What happens if I take the door off? Oh no, what's going to happen? Jason's going to fall out! Jason's going to fall out! These activities are designed to encourage students to integrate and synthesize key ideas. Uh, if you take the two wheels off a tractor and the engine off a tractor, it won't work. Yep, then it doesn't do farming. I know the rain garden's a system because if you take the log away, it will it will just go straight down to the ground and it won't water all the plants. The birds um, can help the seeds with dropping off the seeds, then it grows into new trees. The following assessment ideas provide alternative evaluation methods that can be used after consolidation or at any point in the lesson to check for understanding. Flowers. If they're going to, they're going to bring the bees back. In the, in, and they're going to do some pollen to make honey. Because they're all connected. Allowing time for students to take action is an essential part of the learning process on climate change as it empowers students and eases their eco-anxiety. We hope that you believe that climate change is as important as we do and could see and hear the immense benefits and understanding that your students will gain, as well as give them the tools to make a difference in their communities. 
So each one of those uh, inquiries has a short film, but I wanted to just show one so you can see how the steps of inquiry are outlined with a few examples. And that format continues right up to the, some of the grade 12 materials as well around the steps leading to action. So with this one, you can see that because it's a, we're having a discussion of STEM today, we wanted to think about what might be a through line right from K to 12. And so um, the systems thinking approach is the one that I wanted to make sure that we, we started with and we can continue with throughout. So if you look at this in, in, um, under chapter two, the first inquiry is systems in our world. And they talk about the bike and they talk about um, how that can work. And then they relate it to some of their own systems that they see all around them. And um, what it does is do a little review there and then it will go into the inquiry itself, which we hope will load. There we are, systems in our world. So it goes through those steps, the provocation, which you saw, the, pro the ge question generation, developing those uh, methods of how to ask questions, the knowledge building, the determining understanding, looking at systems in their own uh, life and their world and being able to sort that, pursuing learning by developing their own representation of what a system is. And I think in those ways, you can start to move them through that process of bringing that big concept to something that they can understand. Um, there is a section also at the beginning that I should mention that is about um, resources for teachers around their understanding around the concepts. With some of these in this grade level, it's not as difficult, but when you get to some of the grade six and seven topics or the, the K to 12, some of the background information might be more information, more more appropriate appropriate for the uh, teacher. So, looking at the three to six guide now, we're going to stay on a little bit with those um, systems thinking ideas. Let's get it to load. There we are. It's got the same kind of general format, and uh, we're going to look at chapter two there. How does climate change affect our world again? That similar theme as we looked at. And in this time, this uh, point, again, there's a film. But what I wanted to point out a little bit is um, that this background information, it does tell you what you need to know, but it will give you a fully a full explanation of what each of those things are. So it, it doesn't leave you in the lurch of wondering what, what I should be doing. Um, we're introducing the idea in, in this area with the systems thinker cards and I have to shout out to Pam Miller who introduced this to me many years ago. And these cards and this uh, organization, and they've been updating their material all the time. And Pam, if you wanna unmute at any point just to, to add your thoughts to it, but they are really a very good way of thinking about, we're learning the process of design and we're reading the process of, um, of uh, problem solving. And this allows you to not only know what are systems, but also what kind of habits of mind, what kind of cognitive skills do we need to bring to any of these complex problems? Um, uh, all the way to, to uh, from, from engineering to coding to computer science, we're gonna need these kinds of skills in order to be able to deal with some of them. And many of them are around how we approach a problem. And some of them are about how do we self-manage as humans as we get into these complex, wicked problems that need uh, a very um, uh, wide ranging and multi-step uh, solutions. So just for an example, you know, see, observes how elements within a system change over time. And what's great about that is that if you flip over the card, it'll give you some questions that you could ask about that. Sees change over time as the dyna dynamics of a system. So things are never static, they're always changing. And you can see how you can introduce different variables to any operation and it will show how it might change. So that's one that's pretty um, easily adapted to different situations. I like the one where it talks about the uh, cause and effect. And certainly when people are analyzing problems, they're looking at what are the causes of this? What are the potential effects? What are the intended and the unintended consequences of any action and how that works within a model you're developing? or a ro robotics that you're developing, or it could be 
when you're thinking of human problems and changes and how um, there's a circular pattern to that as well. I Thanks, really Susan. I was going to say, just if I could just jump in. Please do. Um, what I like about the systems thinking is that we're working with a school right now who's trying to fix their snack program. Right now, they, since COVID, a lot of our snack programs are overpackaged and they have a lot of processed food uh, to avoid the contact. But now snack programs can get back to um, buying fresh food, et cetera, but uh, folks haven't moved. So what I wanted the students to do is we use these cards so they didn't point fingers, so that they unpack their assumptions. And um, a funny uh, quip is we they they actually wanted to start with toilet paper because they felt <laughs> that the toilet paper in their school for students was less quality than the toilet paper for the adults. And so we use the systems thinking cards to look at, well, what assumptions are we making when we ask those questions? Um, so yeah, really powerful stuff. So thanks for bringing them. Yeah, and they've just redesigned them in the last few years that I think they're making it easier and easier to use. And um, making a set of these questions or these, uh, these habits so that you have them kind of to use flexibly in the classroom, certainly maybe at the beginning of a design challenge or the middle or the end, it really helps kind of open up the discussion quite a bit more to say, okay, how we considered this. Um, I, I think the one that I like a lot is this one, uses understanding of system structure to identify possible leverage actions. Certainly it's easily applicable to anything to do with simple machines and levers and pulleys. Uh, or, you know, later on when you're doing, um, you know, pneumatic, you're designing pneumatic or hydraulic lifts, or when you're doing mechanical advantage, um, calculating mechanical advantage in the, in, uh, uh, I think it's grade seven or eight, I can't remember which one it's in. Um, but that kind of, this card would really be, uh, you know, helpful in doing that, looking at that. But it's also very good when you're trying to choose to take an action that might be, um, a next step to what you've learned, you want to make sure that you're using, you're, you've designed it so that this one action might actually have a spin off in a positive action somewhere else. It might make something else easier as well. So I think these are very, very useful. And I think uh, having a set of them, uh, they also have uh, a lot of free tra training. So if you can do a short course and just how to use them and uh, it's just on their website. So I think that's, it's very useful for people. And then what we've tried to do is we've tried to use those cards, introduce those cards, but then the next inquiries kind of uh, show how you can use one or two cards. So when you go into it, you'll see, oh, use this card or use this card. So um, it's there. So I think uh, it gives you nice little starting points. This one, um, in the uh, in the in the second one gives you a little bit about the systems in our community as well. So you can think about your neighborhood as a community, or your school grounds as a community, or you know the bathroom in the school is is a system. So how does that work together, and what how do we need to what do we need to do to improve that? If it, it maybe it's the maybe it's uh, something they hadn't thought of before. Um, so. There are uh, examples that you can use, I think, in, in a lot of different areas, um, starting with the idea of introducing systems in the, in the younger grades and then moving into systems thinking later and what we need to be. Um, I'm just going to point out one other thing in, the, um, in Chapter 3 inquiry, how does addressing climate change make us healthier? Um, another kind of uh, connection that you can make. Um, you may have been doing um, something to do with water or the water cycle, and it will bring that in um, to uh, the idea of more kind of science information and science language. So in this one, for example, under, um, I think it's under, yeah, under knowledge building, I'm just going to have a quick look at that under inquiry three. Just going to open that up. Exploring Inquiry 3. It has uh, a number of resources that you can use um, as a whole class, but it also gives you an active strategy of it's a kind of change in around a change of the jigsaw pattern, jigsaw um, 
strategy in order to get them to think about a bit more of their um, how their knowledge is coming together. So let me just show you that. So it has the jigsaw, five different things that they could look at, infographics, um, videos of different types. But I, the one I wanted to show was the one about the dinosaur pee. I don't know if you've seen that one, but it brings in some of those ideas together. Thirsty? How about a nice cold glass of dinosaur pee? Ah, so refreshing. <laughs> Okay, let me explain. Last time we learned all about the water cycle. Water circulates around the earth going from a liquid to a gas and occasionally to a solid over and over again. And while I was babbling on about the water cycle, you may have noticed something. Water never leaves leaves the system, and new water never comes in. That makes water a limited resource. There's only a certain amount of it on Earth, no more and no less, and that amount never changes. So, what does it mean when we say that water is a limited resource? Remember that water is matter, and matter is made up of particles. As we've learned, the particles can move around, changing states, buddying up with other particle friends, but new particles can't be created from nothing, and they can't be totally destroyed. This is called the conservation of matter. Since water keeps cycling over and over again on our planet, without adding or removing matter, we say it's a closed system. Well, it's a mostly closed system. Teensy amounts can leak out into space and whatnot, but for our purposes, let's assume it's closed. Now, if you were paying super close attention last time, you may have noticed that we only talked about three of the Earth's four spheres. We talked about how water, the hydrosphere, interacts with the geosphere in liquid form and the atmosphere in vapor form. Can you tell which one we missed? You're looking at it. Me, and you, and us. Okay, we're not gonna show the whole thing there because it's, I just wanted you to get an idea of it and uh, um, how it can be used to add more of the language that we need around at, uh, the scientific language that we can use to systems and systems thinking later on. So these are all examples that are that are in the, uh, actually, I don't know if anybody else has seen the rest of that series. There's so many videos in that series that are useful for the classroom. So. If you have, please make a note, because I, I really like the few of them that I've used with kids. They seem to really enjoy them. So that's uh, the second one, uh, the second level, the, the junior level. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time dipping into the K to 12. And that one has a slightly different uh, way of working. Um, it has a couple other areas that maybe have not been looked at before around Kind of branching out beyond the classroom into uh, larger scale data to look at and to and to develop some inquiries from. So this one, if you have a look at the um, what does climate change and why care is the first one always, but it has a different kind of dashboard of inquiries that you might consider at the K to at the seven to twelve level. So um, it has uh, something that we used as a kind of um, dashboard for learning. Um, which is the Climate Atlas of Canada. And I don't know if people have used it and if, if you can add to the chat that you've used it for certain things, but we're going to explore a little bit about that. And it's a, a pretty impressive database that, uh, that's been added to over time and has features have been developed over time as well that you can um, go through an inquiry where it, it progressively puts you into different areas of, of, the, uh, of the map itself. So there is an inquiry here, as you can see, it's got the whole process, but just for today, I'm just gonna show you the map very briefly and, and talk about a couple of features of it that might be useful for our seven to 12 teachers. So, and if, if you've used the map as I get, again, please you know, give a little shout out of what you've used it for. So this has the, the map of Canada. It's got uh, a number of features that you can change the variables, the time frame. Uh, you can see it, what would it be like, what would the modeling be like between uh, 25 and 35, the 25 and 50. Um, you can also set lots of the parameters to see what you'd like to find out more about. So if you're looking at hot weather, there's a lot of a number of heat waves, the cooling degrees, the summer days, 
the very hot days that are that are a plus 30 degrees. And you can set that as one of your parameters. And then you can look at an area to say, well, what does it mean for my school or my neighborhood? Um, cold weather, weather also has its own, but very cold freeze thaw cycles. And as we know, that's one of the challenges. We get very cold and then followed by very much, much warmer. And that back and forth is, is one of our challenges. Um, the heating degree days, the freezing degree days, mild winter days, all those things you can you can customize your search basically, depending on what you'd like to do. Medium uh, temperature, precipitation, and an area around what effects that might have on agriculture, number of growing days, lengthening or number of dry days or between rain. So that's those things can be explored. The menu over here, just to have a quick look, has all these different areas that you can find out about, um, more resources and videos, as well as um, some articles that relate to it. One of the things that I really like about it, though, is, and you can get this printout, as it has over here about your, your uh, local neighborhood, but one of the things I really like is that they have these um, and tiny little um, sort of videos about not just what the challenges are, but what people are doing for solutions. So you can watch a short video from maybe something in your area. In fact, it's interesting because one of them is I'm coming from Niagara and Lake here and I, the kids notice this structure that's in all our farmers fields, that, especially in the grape areas. And it's a kind of looks like a little windmill and none of the kids knew what it was and I didn't know what it was. And I'm actually looking at them all the time. And there's a video in the climate Atlas showing how it's a it's a method of moving the air around to keep the grapes, the, the roots warm enough, but so they don't have too much inefficiency. They are connected to a project with Brock University, which helps them know and they've got a, a feedback loop around temperature so they can tell exactly what, um, when and what they should do in terms of turning them on and turning them off so they can use the best use of it. So we were able to find something when we used it with my grade seven, eight class that I was working with. We found something on the Climate Atlas, just about a solution in our own neighborhood. And that can be pretty inspiring as well. Are there any questions or comments about that? You were, Peter, you were asking me a little bit whether the data could be exported. And I don't know if you were able to find out anything about that. Uh, actually, I was just looking at the the data sources page, uh, I, I don't see a direct link to the data. Uh, they mention, you know, sort of, they, they, they name the places, but there's no direct links. Okay. Yeah. Um, we did have a question come up about, can this website be used at all to do projections, like related to heat or flooding? Yes, yes. And you can set the time, you know, if you want it next 25 years, you want it 50 years, you know, yes, definitely. And that's one of the main features of it. And you can also get the printout of your say, I was looking at one for and I just put in as a practice as Kingston, and it will give you the, the temperature projections for the next 50 years. So yes, that's actually one of its main functions. Excellent. Any other questions about that? So if you're unsure about how to use it, for example, you want to maybe you would want to start using it, but you're not sure you could obviously go through the inquiry. And you know, that introduces all the aspects of it. So I think as that becomes more, um, it becomes more uh, uh, populated with more and more of these solutions. And I think we always talk about how, yes, we have to temper and we have to balance the number of challenges we, we set in front of the kids with the, with the number of solutions and focusing on solutions, both local and national and international um, is certainly a way to support that wellness and the well-being through the, the journey of learning about climate change. So that is the, the those are the three uh, documents that we have there that I think can be very useful for students, for teachers and students. It's a, it's a great website. It also has um, uh, quite a bit of uh, information, just background for teachers. So I just wanted to point out it has an active uh, learning strategy bank that you can go to as well, which is um, 
kind of a, a dashboard of all the different active learning strategies that are used throughout the three documents. So if you're not sure what a value line is, or, you know, you just, you know, they mentioned something, but there's not enough explanation, you can go to that section as well. So those are the elements of the climatelearning.ca that I wanted to touch on today. I hope that that's going to be useful for you. And uh, there was one other that I wanted to just dive into just for a few minutes before we, uh, before we finish is the resources for rethinking. And this is something that LSF has developed over about, I think about 15 years or more. And it's just had a refresh in a lot of areas to make sure that we've updated them related to the sustainable development goals, as well as more and more on STEM and more and more on climate learning. So this is a, uh, it's a kind of a standalone website that we have as part of um, LSF. And uh, you can read a little bit about where the resources come from, but there's so much in there. There's hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of uh, materials in there, but it's hard to know, you know, exactly where to start. So what you can do is do a search. And so let's just do an example of that briefly, say Ontario. And if we've got some people in, let's say grade six, and if we're looking at, let's say, Well, I could do pretty well anything, but let's let's do science. And if I wanted to add a little bit more by curriculum unit, maybe we'll do STEM since that's what we're talking about today. And it also you can choose by action projects, by inquir inquiry resources, STEM resources. I'm just going to put that in there again to see what comes up. And you can do a search, and it will come up with a few things that you could consider toolkits of various types. Um, you can also go, this one is the, I'm just gonna take that part off to see if I can open it up a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, there's a, a bunch of things that you can do, electricity, reusable bags, water and sanitation, climate change, creating solutions. So there's a number of things you could dip into um, to see what might work for your, um, for your classroom or related to the curriculum that you're teaching as well. So it's a very good resource on a lot of um, K to 12 uh, materials that you could use. And it is always being updated. I think the thing about it is that we have a group of people who what they just love to do is search for stuff, rate stuff, evaluate it, how it relates to curriculum. They love reading curriculum from all the different provinces. And they seem to say, oh, yeah, that's a match. That's a match. That's a match. So, you know, these are things that we uh, have available. Almost all of them are free um, and they uh, relate to curriculum in, in very clear ways. I just wanted to point out a couple other things about the Climate Atlas. There is a student handbook that could be considered to be, you know, used at the same time. I noticed just recently there's a teacher handbook as well. So that might be a resource for you. And looking at that map, I think that there's lots of applications. And I, I wanted to take a moment to think if anybody had, can think of um, something that they could use the Climate Atlas for, just to, to pose a question there for a moment. If anybody in the chat, you know, I see this, oh, I think this could relate to something that I'm doing. It would be great to hear some, you know, brainstorming suggestions um, about what the Climate Atlas and or um, some of the others resources might be used for. We'll come back to that. The other element of the, uh, well, it's in every one of the inquiries, but it's, it has its own separate section in the uh, 7 to 12 document of the Empowering Learners for a Warming World is the Taking Action section, and they call it Youth Agency. And one of the things that they really want to emphasize that once you've got kids learning about something, they want to apply it to their life and to the, the situation that they find themselves in and the problems that they see all around them. So it does have a very good basic walkthrough of all the steps to taking action. And there are lots of materials out there about that, but we wanna make sure that we've, can, you know, we've added a very um, you know, teacher-friendly way of approaching it. So it does give you all the steps and outlines all the steps. 
And um, within it, there are re recommendations of resources that you could use to illustrate that. So for example, step, step one is choosing an issue or getting connected to an issue. And it has a lot of resources that you could consider. Um, I don't know if anybody has used the project drawdown um, videos and, and information. They've got a whole new set of quite beautiful uh, videos that could be used to help explore uh, possible uh, climate solutions and which ones we should be focusing on. So I think that's a really good um, support for teachers as well. So the resource for rethinking, oh, do we have any suggestions there about the climate atlas? Uh, no, nothing came in. Nothing came in. Just as a summary around that, yes, I couldn't remember the number, but it's about 1,700 lesson plans and books that are in there. Again, searchable by language and grade and theme and SDG. Those have been added in the last little while. Uh, Pam just dropped a note in STEM focus on designing resilient buildings, using the Atlas to learn what challenges buildings slash communities will face in the future, heat, flooding, water shortage, food security, et cetera, then using Lego or other building tools. Exactly. Wonderful. Right. So looking at the data and then saying, how, what should we be doing with our buildings? Right. And again, it will probably give you uh, it. I, I can think of a couple of those little videos that are related to buildings on the, on the map. So just in summary, but I, we will have some time for questions as well. If, uh, if people have some they'd like to ask, people say, you know, what is the best approach to keep teaching climate change and what do we know so far? And again, to try to get that interdisciplinary, uh, even if it's, you know, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, that's an amazing start to connect subject areas together. It's preferable because again, climate change is connected to all parts of life and will affect all of those things. And uh, we really think it's a great opportunity for them to build a sound foundational knowledge of things, but also find ways to apply them. And it makes the, uh, the STEM really come alive by connecting it to climate solutions and of course their own futures and their and future ideas that they might have about their own careers. So I'm gonna stop it there. Um, and uh, just to say thank you for the opportunity to do this. I have added about 10 pages of resources at the end because there's not enough time to go into some of them, but just to let you know that there's a, a whole range of resources and websites that have been useful to a lot of teachers that they've given um, their kind of uh, thumbs up on and that we've used in other PD uh, sessions for teachers. And just to let you know that uh, Learning for Sustainable Future has a lot of PD offerings for teachers in a range of ways. Um, so just contact us if you'd like to learn more about that. So thank you everyone. I hope this is helpful and you got one or two good ideas that will help you with your, your work with students. Susan, I have a question. Sure. I, I just was actually listening to a podcast where Jody Williams talked about how in Ontario, uh, we're really focusing on STEM um, at the expense of Indigenous ways of knowing and, and knowledges. Mm -hmm. And that part was removed from our curriculum. But I see that LSF still has that uh, connection to Indigenous knowledges in your, in your documents. Are you getting any pushback? We're not, in, we're not getting pushback um, when schools have their own Indigenous partners. If they've developed their, uh, if they have an elder that works with their school or with their school board, those materials are um, kind of mediated or uh, uh, connect, or, you know, interconnected with the materials that, and the approaches that they're, that they're bringing. Um, when it's a standalone, there can be more difficulty, and I appreciate that that is, you know, a concern. But really, we're trying to have a way of kind of creating an expectation that uh, schools will be developing those partnerships in authentic ways where information can be shared. Hmm. What yeah. are you finding? What are you finding? Well, I think the teachers are pushing back on the curriculum. I think they're excluding it regardless, which is probably good. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think uh, rightly, you know, people are thinking we want to do this 
appropriately, right? Correctly. And how do we do that? And do we understand what we need to do? Um, I think there has been some direction, but I think generally, um, you know, we're trying to say, okay, how can we not, um, how can we include the, the uh, approaches and the understanding and the knowledge in a way that makes sense and that is uh, respectful and, in, and integrated. Um, and you, know, you can put some information out and then you have to have the um, support and, and uh, kind of leadership from your, um, from your indigenous learners in the area. And that's usually how it, it, I think schools are trying to manage some of that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Um, I agree with the chat that we need more on how to do this well. Uh, yeah. So thanks so much. Yeah. It's it's a it's a complex area, but is it is it the right thing to do to never to not find not approach with a question with questions, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, respectful exactly. question with, with a respectful question. Well, thank you so much again, Susan. Thank you.